All right, good morning. We're glad you're here this morning. We are starting a brand new series that during the summer we're going to be looking at the life of Joseph. So it's going to be really easy if you bring your Bibles. You just have to go to the first book. I mean, that's it's simple. Simple this summer. That's what we're going with. So you can flip over the book of Genesis, and that's where we're going to find uh, the story of Joseph and the story that we're going to be looking at through uh, this entire summer. In fact, Genesis 37 through 50 covers the entire uh, part of Joseph's story, and so that's where we're going to find ourselves. So this morning I want to do a little bit of a backstory, and then I want to give you an idea of a picture that is the best way to think about um, his life. That just this statement that will help us understand, oh, this is the life of Joseph. This is how I think about Joseph. So uh, that's what I want to do, because if you just jump into Joseph's story, and without any idea what's going on, without any, any idea of backstory, it, it's going to be hard for you to understand kind of what is going on. Okay, So God has a plan from, from the first couple chapters where, where God creates a beautiful creation and, and man just decides to ruin that, that he has a plan to rescue and redeem his fallen creation. What you need to know is on that day God didn't go, uh-oh, what are we going to do? I don't know what to do. I didn't plan for this. They weren't supposed to eat that. Why did you do that? I don't know what to do now. And so they had a big powwow in heaven. They figured it out. No. He already knew what was going to happen, knew what was going to take place, and already had a rescue plan set in motion to redeem his fallen creation. And that's why it says it right in Genesis chapter 3. God has a plan in the midst of that. So God would choose a man who would begin a nation which would bring forth the Messiah. Now, I, I want to help us understand something that I think we get this out, out of line at times, okay? He begins with Abraham, and this is true for everything that we've studied. We've looked over the past several years at Abraham, and, and then a couple years ago we looked at Jacob, and, and then Joseph, and here's what we get wrong. We, we look at these stories and we go, well, Abraham must have been special. How do I become like Abraham? No, God chose Abraham, so Abraham was special. That's why we have him, because God said, no, I want him. Wait a minute, you want the 70-year-old who has no heirs? He has, right, uh, his, his wife is barren, can't give birth. Wait a minute, that's who you're going to build a nation through? I'm, I'm sure people said, wait a minute, God, I, I don't think you know what you're doing. I don't think you know, that guy, that Abraham, the guy who grew up in a pagan home, that guy, you don't want that guy, you can't want that guy. And so... If we don't understand that, we get everything wrong, okay? You will see this in lots of places where all of a sudden we think, well, they must be special. No, God chose them so they're special. Same true with the nation of Israel, and we kind of get that all mixed up at times too. We're like, oh, well, God chose them. It began with Abraham. They are special because God chose them. God didn't chose, choose them because they were special. You understand it's the choosing of God that makes something special. And so he begins with Abraham. This promise in Genesis chapter 12. Then I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. And I will make your name great. And that's why everybody knows the name Abraham nowadays, right? Why is that? Because of this promise. God keeps his promise. You're going to be a great nation. I'm going to bless you. Your name will be great. So that, right, no, Abraham, I'm going to pile this all on you so everybody will say, oh, Abraham was great. No, 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 no. There's always a so that. There's always a so that. Everything God gives you is a so that. So that I'm going to do something. So that because I'm giving it to you, oh, watch what I'm going to do through that. Abraham, you know why I'm going to do all that through you? So that all the families of the earth may receive blessing through you. And if you think, well, that, what, what does that mean? We, we get gold coins with Abraham's face on it? Nope. You know what that means? The blessing was Jesus. The blessing was Jesus Christ. That's how all the nations of the earth get blessed. Because Jesus came, died in our place, rose again for our salvation. That's really important to know as we get ready to go into the life of Joseph. This backstory, why God did what he did, ultimately to bring forth Jesus. That we'd be redeemed and saved. That's why he did everything he did. So y you have to know that when you're going into that. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all had to learn to trust God and his plan. They all had to. We saw that in all sorts of different ways as we looked at Abraham and Jacob. They had to get to this point where 
either I'm just going to think I'm smart and I can figure it out and, and, and I'm clever and watch what I'm going to do, God, or, or we're going to say, okay, God, I don't have a clue. Um, I'm going to trust your plan. I'm going to trust your story. I'm going to trust everything you want to do in my life. I'm going to trust for your provision. I'm going to trust everything that you want to do. And all of these characters have to do that. They have to learn to trust God and his plan. And by the way, if you want to know, every time they don't trust God, those are the parts of the stories we like because, oh, man, that guy's just like us. Abraham was just like us. We'd have done that same thing. We like that, right? We love that part, okay? Because those are the times they couldn't trust the story. They couldn't trust what God was doing. They couldn't. So they jumped in on their own, and they created a mess. And some of those messes we still see today. So Joseph. Joseph. Again, Joseph wasn't, oh my goodness, this is a special God, and so God's going to choose him. No, his story is amazing, and I believe it's amazing because of what he learned, okay? And so we're going to begin with the beginning, okay? The birth. His mom was just like Sarah. She, she was barren. She could not give Jacob children. And by the way, that family, uh, and we'll look at that more probably in a couple weeks on Father's Day, that family was uh, interesting. We'll just put it that way. It was interesting, okay? So this is where Joseph is born. He becomes the oldest of the, the two kids that his mom gives birth to. Then God took note of Rachel. He paid attention to her and enabled her to become pregnant. By the way, that's a huge verse in our day. That's a huge verse. That, that the womb belongs to the Lord. What, did, what does he do? What does he love to do? Bring forth children. He enables that. He does that. We forget about that in our own day. She became pregnant. She gave birth to a son, and then she said, God has taken away my shame. By the way, that's not why she named him Joseph, okay? This is just her declaration. God has taken away my shame. He has given me a child, which I'm just telling you in that day, that everything to, to be given and to have the ability to bring forth heirs. God has taken away my shame, and she named him Joseph saying, may the Lord give me yet another son. So Joseph is a play on words in the Hebrew with the word increase. So so in other words, can you imagine that? Oh, I want more. Okay, that's basically what she did, okay? She uh, she has Joseph, and, and she names him, I want more. That's basically what she does. I want more. I want more. I like this. This is this first child. I want to have I want to have lots more. I want to give Jacob l- many more children. So that's what she does. That's where the name Joseph comes from. It simply means increase. Increase and more. Why Joseph? Why wh- wh- why why Joseph? Why study Joseph? Why is Joseph talked about more than any of the other brothers? And so, by the way, if you would go to Matthew and you would look at the genealogy, Joseph is not in the genealogy of Jesus. If if you've ever noticed that, so it's like, wait a minute, why are all these pages dedicated to Joseph? Because of what happens in his life, who he's able to trust, and this, this big part of the story of Israel, how they end up in Egypt, and ultimately, in the book of Exodus, how they are delivered. So that is why we have this incredible amount of Joseph. We also do because of a phrase that is where I want to take us today. He wasn't perfect. Please don't think that. He trusted the Lord and followed him no matter what took place in his life. That's why I think we're going to be able to relate to him. Because he, had, he learned to trust that God was in control, that God was sovereign, that God was working in his life. No matter what happens. And if you don't know the story of Joseph, he had a lot happen in his life that we're going to run into and we're going to see over the next several weeks. We're going to see what happened. We're going to see what took place and be like, wow, he went through a lot. So if you feel like you're going through a lot right now, you're dealing with a lot of things, and it's the enemy's way of whispering into your ear saying, I don't know, does God really care about you? God really really around right now. Maybe he's too busy doing else. Maybe you sinned. Maybe you sinned and he's upset at you right now. 
And if what's going on in your life is causing you to doubt the goodness of God, to doubt what God is doing in your life, to doubt that, that he has a plan, he has a purpose, that you can trust him, oh, you are going to love the story of Joseph. Because you're going to be able to relate to this whole idea that in the midst of everything going on, we can trust God and his plan. So in Genesis chapter 39, if you would turn there, I want you to see something. And if you have your Bibles, you might want to just highlight it, circle it. If you're using the Bible app, you can highlight on that, you know, uh, because I want you to see this. This is going to be key. It actually appears four times, but the fourth is kind of just the pronoun, not the word. And I wanted to see you to see his name being used over and over and over again when it comes to this. Now, Genesis 39 Genesis 39, which you need to know is most of what's happened to Joseph uh, has happened to him. And in Genesis 39, he is in Egypt. And you wonder how he gets there. Well, his brothers who love him so much beat him up, throw him in a well, and sold him into slavery. Okay? So be, be thankful you're not part of that family. Okay? As bad as it is, did you get beat up, thrown in a well, and sold into slavery? Okay? That's what happened to Joseph. And so in Genesis 39, he's in Egypt. He's in Egypt, and three times, here's what we hear. The Lord was with Joseph. Simple, simple little phrase. Your, yours might say it just a little bit different, and then there's one point where it says, the Lord was with him, so you could say it says it four times, but over and over again, in verse 2, in verse 21, in verse 23, the Lord was with Joseph. He was with him where? Well, he's with him when he went to Egypt. And that wasn't his choice. He got sold by his brothers. And he gets taken off to Egypt. He gets placed by, name, by a guy by the name of Potiphar. Okay? And it says the Lord was with him. And all of a sudden Potiphar is seeing that his household's going well. And everything's going great. And then Joseph, because Potiphar's wife is going to uh, go after him. Uh, she doesn't care that she's married. She's going after Joseph. She likes the way he looks. Uh, and ultimately, because he will not do what she wants him to do and go to bed with her, that she accuses him of rape. When she does that, because he is a slave, he is thrown immediately into prison. Don't think do rights. Don't think trial. Don't think due process, trial, nothing. Nope, you're, you're going to jail. And in jail, what does it say? The Lord was with Joseph. Really? He did nothing. Yeah, the Lord was with Joseph. And then all of a sudden, he, he begins to see, see that the jailers are going to treat him the same way Potiphar does. Man, put this guy in charge of more. He's really trustworthy. You think somebody went, man, I don't, I don't think this guy's prison material, right? I don't think this guy deserves to be here. But again, he's in prison. And, and, and what does the text tell us? The Lord was with Joseph. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? Over and over and over again, the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. And here's what I just want to land on, if I can today, before we get into this full story and everything else that happens. This is what you have to remember about Joseph. He understood this truth. The Lord is with me. The Lord is is with me. Yep. Brothers beat me up, sold me into slavery. I'm in Egypt now. The Lord is with me. This guy Potiphar, he picks me up, and, and all of a sudden now I'm, I, I'm working in his house. The Lord is with me. I get falsely accused and thrown into prison. The Lord is with me. You see how that works? It didn't, it didn't matter his circumstances. It didn't matter what was going on. He just kept this, this, the text just keeps telling us that. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. A and here's what I, I just, I, I just could not escape over the past couple of years. Do, do, do you know this? Do I, do I know this? D do you know that? I is that a truth in your life? Do you know that the Lord is with you? Do you know that? Or, again, are the circumstances trying to tell you he isn't? He isn't. That he left. 
he's angry, he's whatever, fill in the blank. Do you know that the Lord is with you? You've come to Christ. I want to be very specific. You've come to Christ, repented of your sins. You are now a son, a daughter of God. Do you understand that? If you're not that, then I'm not talking to you. I would love for you to come to know Christ and to become and be adopted into his family as a son or daughter of God. That's just awesome. That's just awesome. And if you haven't been there yet, and that goes, anybody watching online, oh, we'd love for you to do that, okay? Because you have to get there first before you understand this truth that the Lord is with you. I'm just saying after that happens, you're a son and daughter of God. You're a part of God's family. He has adopted you in his family, which he has done because he died in your place and rose again for your salvation. You did zero. You did zero, but repent of your sins and trust him. Just, just, just get that right. You didn't, you didn't come to church. You didn't memorize a bunch of verses. And God said, wow, you're, you're good. No, 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 we're not. We're not. And I don't, I don't care, okay? I, 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 I was appalled that, that the guy who should know scripture you know, because he's got a title named Pope, would go on 60 Minutes and just basically tell everybody he doesn't know Scripture. He goes, oh, everybody's basically good. No, no, we're not. We are apart from God. We are separated from God. We are lost without Jesus. We have to understand that. We're not born and we're bent towards good. And I would, No, 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 no. Come on. We all know that's not true because none of us none of us had the days where we had to teach our kids to do wrong okay hey kids today we're gonna learn how to do wrong you never had that lesson okay you had the lesson where you were trying to turn them no 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 we don't do that no we don't why because they're bent that way we are all born bent that way and jesus changes that in our lives so you have to know that now once you're going down there the lord is with you that's what i want to drive home in these next few minutes that the lord is with you you have to remember when god feels distant he isn't he never left he never left somehow you have got to remind yourself of that over and over again he didn't leave he didn't leave you weren't left alone you didn't sin so bad, he decided to just, you know, just leave you. He didn't do that. So when he feels distant, and he will, he will, because we are a feelings-based culture that puts so much stock into feelings at times, we don't know how to respond to the truth. So when he feels distance, I need you to remember he isn't. He never left. I want to share with you something that Paul did. He went into Mars Hill, which is in Athens, and, you know, here's all these really smart people, but he was troubled when he went into Athens because there were idols everywhere, everywhere. And he just says the city was full of idols. And he walks in, and he gets into a conversation where they allow him to speak before this, this group and he makes this statement. This is a really, really big statement. From one man, he made every nation of the human race to inhabit the entire earth. Talking about God. From one man, he made every nation of the human race to inhabit the entire earth. Determining their set times and fixed limit of places where they would live. You ever thought about that? You are in the time you live, in the place you live, for a reason. Do you know what that reason is? Watch this. So that they would search for God, perhaps like grope for him, just grab, trying to find him, around for him, and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. I love that statement. Because he's just talking to a bunch of people like, what are you talking about, God? We think God's way off, or he's, it, it's a myth. And then they had a statue saying to the unknown God. And he's like, do you understand? You live in Athens for a reason? You understand it was probably, I don't know, 50, maybe 50 A.D. 
You, do you know you live in 50 AD because perhaps you would know who God is? I, I, isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Do you realize that in 2024 you are here living in Iowa that you would know that God is near, that he has determined that? Now, I think it's interesting. You know, if you ask people this, people have different opinions. Oh, I wish I lived another time. So I looked up some of those. There's, t- there's like two time periods that stick out, okay? The first one is the Renaissance. I have no idea why, okay? I, I think some people are forgetting stuff, okay? Uh, really? Yeah. I, know, I know you went to the Renaissance Fair, and you went, wow, it'd be really cool. And when you went to the Renaissance Fair, you went with your uh, cell phone, which didn't exist, okay, probably had to use the bathroom, which didn't exist, okay, all this stuff, and you're like, oh, but it would have been wonderful, no, it wouldn't have been, it was for them, okay, because that's the time that God created, so that was the first one, okay, that stands out, everybody's like, oh, I just want to live during the Renaissance, right, that's the first one, the second one, okay, and I think because, because, you know, we want history like history, it is the colonial period of America, the colonial period of of America. Oh, that'd be so cool, fighting the British, right? Uh, right? They pro- I'm sorry, they probably go after the war. Well, after the war, right? Uh, they're all gone, and now we have our nation, right? I, I, don't, I don't think. Again, I don't think we remember some things, okay? Now, I was fortunate enough to live and grow up on the East Coast. I saw some of those houses, okay? Some of you wouldn't make it. I don't want to make it, okay? I'm like, Really? okay? My garage is bigger than the house was, okay? It's like, wow, okay? But we have some sort of, oh, I really wish, and I just want you to lean in. Do you know you are alive now, and you live where you live so that you would know the Lord? So you would know the Lord. He's put you here in this time, in this place, that you would know him. He actually had a reason for it. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't just a random mishap of steps. It wasn't. You are here for a purpose and a reason, and you understand so much of that is that you would know that God is near, that you would know that God is near, that you would know that the Lord is with you. When you come to him in saving faith and find your Lord and Savior, and he says, you're a son and daughter, I'm adopting you, and, and, that you would know that he is near. And that, uh, that's just amazing to me, okay? Ephesians, Paul puts it this way. But now in Christ Jesus, you who used to be far away have been brought near by what? The blood of Christ. Brought near by the blood of of Christ. Another reminder. So, may I just end with two questions. The first one is this. Do you know the Lord is with you? you you've come to Christ, okay? I'm talking two groups here. You've come to Christ, but, but we could just be honest. There's some rough stuff that happened in your life. Perhaps a spouse sinned against you, right? Sinned, broke the covenant of marriage, and it's, right, it's hard right now. You didn't think it was going to be hard and difficult and, right, it was going to be happily ever after. And that Walt Disney promised all of us it was going to be happily ever after. And it isn't. And I'm telling you, because of circumstances in your life, you know, whether that's health reasons or other things, you might be doubting that the Lord is with you. But you've come to Christ. You're a son and daughter of his. I am telling you, he is with you. He is with you. Now, if you don't know that, we'd love to have you come to faith in Christ. Love to see that happen in your life. That you would give your life to Christ, that that he would redeem and save and rescue. He would adopt you into his family, and you are a son and daughter of God. Because then there's a second question. How would it change your life if you knew that truth? If you knew that truth, the Lord is with me. How would that change everything? How would that change some things in your life to know that? To know that he is with you. I, I'm telling you, you're going to read Joseph's story and you're going to be like, how did, how did he make it through that? And how did he make it through that? And how did he make it? Because, because he just held on to this truth that the Lord is with me. And I always wonder, because the text doesn't tell us, where do you think he might have learned that? Maybe from his dad. Well, 
sometimes we don't realize that genealogies, you know, uh, run over in Scripture because we just think a story ends and, well, they must have died at some point. But some of these characters, they overlap. So here's what I wonder. Do you think little Joseph, because, by the way, when he is thrown in the pit and sold into slavery, he is 17. He is 17 years old. But do you think little Joseph, talking to his grandfather Isaac, had him tell the story of Mount Moriah. You think he, t- I, I say, I think he did. I, I'm, I'm like, I bet you he told him that. He told him that whole story and that God provided the sacrifice. And, and at that point, do you realize they, they, they gave God a, an additional thing they called God? And that is, he's Jehovah Jireh. He's our provider. And I wonder if he kept telling, Isaac would just look and say, God's going to provide for you. The Lord is with you. God is going to provide for you. And I wonder if Joseph just took that to heart, maybe more than any of his brothers understood from Grandpa Isaac, who might have said, you know, I have experienced God in an incredible way, and I've seen him do some amazing things. And Joseph took that truth and held on to it no matter what happened in his life. That we would do the same thing would be incredible. And I would just invite you this morning to re-surrender to that truth. The Lord is with you. We're going to take communion together this morning. If you're not reminded by anything else, please be reminded by those two elements, the cup and the bread, that Jesus died so that we could be adopted into the family of God. So our sins could be forgiven so that the Lord would be near to us. So let's pray, and then we're going to ask a blessing upon the cup and the bread, and we're going to take communion together this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, your spirit helps us. When when we tend to be self-deceived, and I, and I know, especially for those in the room, when we walk through the door, you know, we have to just kind of leave all the, the stuff, the hard stuff for the week outside and come in and pretend it's all great and our lives are wonderful. But Father, for some of us, we have doubted that you are near. This week, we doubted you were near. We had some things happen. Maybe we had to go see a doctor. Maybe... maybe finances are are struggling maybe it has something to do with 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 our family we're dealing with all sorts of things and the enemy is so good to whisper in our ear see you're not loved you think god would treat a son or daughter that way and we've become discouraged and we have believed a lie that you are not near And so this morning, Father, we just want to re-surrender to this truth. We came to you. We aren't saved because we're good. We're saved because you're good. And you provided the sacrifice for us. May we never forget that. And so every day we'd re-surrender again. We are son and daughter of God. And that you are near. Father, above all else... I pray that as we take these two elements today, it would be a reminder to us that you are near. Because I believe we need that reminder. When the enemy's whispering and telling us lies, we need a reminder of the truth. So would you use the cup and the bread to remind us today of just that, that you are near. You are near. And I pray that we would see the way that would change tomorrow morning. We get up and go to work. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. And that throughout the day, we would be reminded of that truth. So bless this time, Father, around your table, taking the elements that you provided for us, that we would know that you are near above any and all else remind us of the truth help us to walk in it 
We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.